Hello and welcome to the last episode of the season of the Ronnie O'Sullivan Show. Coming up, Andy Goldstein chats to Ronnie about his season so far and his expectations ahead of the World Championship. My game is where it was when I was 15, 16. The Rocket talks us through his final frame comeback against Mark Selby at the Masters, arguably one of his best. Plus, the man himself finds out what it takes to be a coach at Sheffield Snooker Academy. You got any tips for me, Pat? Keep the fitness up. That's a good tip. <laughs> Ronnie, you took time off after last year's World Championships um, and you came back, I think, bigger and better and stronger than ever. You won the Masters and, of course, the Welsh Open. Were you surprised just how quickly you got back into your rhythm? Yes. Uh, since I'd had an injury on my back in October, I hadn't really played a good match until the Welsh Open. So to win the Masters, um, I think things kind of fell into place for me to make me win the Masters because certain players that I played probably give me a bit too much respect and probably didn't punish me as hardly as they could have done, whereas maybe if I'd played someone like Higgins or Trump, they may have kind of overcome that a little bit earlier on and sensed danger. Um, but, you know, I was over the moon just to, to get back to playing, to be honest with you, and, uh, and obviously to get the victory in the Masters was uh, just like a, a dream come true, really. Whenever I watch you interviewed after a game that you've won, and sometimes you've won really well, you never pat yourself on the back. And I, I'm just curious as to if you genuinely feel that way about your game or maybe you on purpose put yourself down so people don't expect more the next time you play. I went into the Masters just just basically just having no confidence in what I was... Why don't you have confidence? No, I have confidence in my game and in myself. Yeah. But since but I've because done of the back, injury? Yeah, okay. I wasn't able to get set on the shot properly. So I, I was overhitting shots, underhitting shots. I was hitting across the ball a lot. I was had... The cue didn't feel part of my body. And I'm still kind of having to go to the gym two or three times a week, have personal training to try and get the strength back in my leg because they say it could take anywhere between four months and two years before it's back to how it was. So subconsciously, I, I know how kind of when I'm playing snooker, how everything has to be so perfect, really, you know, in your body. Because, um, you know, if I'm a millimetre out, I might as well be 100 millimetres out when we're talking about top-level sports. So... For me, the body needs to be where it was pre-October the 13th, and you know I'm going to the gym to try and make sure I keep the strength in there. And what about you, your mind with regards to confidence? Um, the knockback you received in last year's World Championship when Stuart Bingham beat you, I think it was 39 after being 9-9. Um, how much did that affect last or this season, the next season for you? Had you won the World Championships, do you think you would have played in more competitions this season? No, I wish I would have probably played in the Champions Cup, maybe Shanghai and the, and the UK Championships, but for various reasons I didn't. So obviously my comeback was uh, more delayed than it should have been really. Um, but no, my confidence wasn't dented by losing by Stuart. I think Stuart played a fantastic match because I didn't I feel like my game was in great shape. I maybe peaked a little bit too early last mm. year. So, no, I had no regrets about losing to Bingham. I think he was a deserved world champion, played really well. I was just a little bit disappointed in my own performance, really. Well, the performance you put in the Welsh Open was, I think, fantastic. One of your best performances from beginning to end that I've seen for a long, long time. Mm. Do you need that as a reminder to yourself as to just what you can do? We all know, of course, what you can do. I think everybody needs that reminder, and, win and winning is a, is a great habit, and it, it gives you confidence. You start to believe much more in yourself. and um, So, yeah, no, I, I felt it was in, important, having won the Masters and, and been really not happy with my performances, to then go into the Welsh and win that, but with unbelievable performances. It showed me that, you know, um, I can get back to where I was pre-doing my back, which if I wasn't able to... If, I, if someone said to me that you played the Masters and that's how you're going to continue to play for the rest of your career, mm. I would never have picked my queue up again, trust me, because I didn't recognise myself when I went to the table. I was like, you know, it scared me. The so how did you win the competition then? I don't know. I just wheeled every ball in. I was just mentally strong. Steve Peters helped me through it. 
um, but I was in I was in a bad way but I just had to do it you know you have to do what you got to do sometimes and mm. you know it was only four or five days and I just thought come on but it was the hardest four or five days of my whole career and the Welsh Open felt like the easiest uh, seven days I could have played another seven eight days there you know because my form was just on another level. Let's talk about the World Championships then of course yeah. um, looking back at last year's championship you must obviously be disappointed everyone talks about you going for that record equal in six win with Steve Davis that would put you one behind Stephen Hendry. These records I'm I know are in your mind. Is this what drives you? The fact that you're close to the six, do you still think you've got it? No, it doesn't that's not what drives me because what drives me is just the enjoyment of playing. And as long as I enjoy playing, then if the tournaments come, fantastic. If they don't come, then you know I have to still have to I then have to evaluate whether I enjoy playing enough and not winning, you know. So I'm not sure whether it's the winning that makes the difference to me. When you got that record equal in six winning the Masters, so your name was alongside Hendry's, how did you feel? No, I, I didn't feel no different between that one and the one when I beat Selby in the final uh, at Addy Pally. <laughs> to be fair, I actually felt better when I beat Selby in the final because I felt like I played one of my best performances. So although I've equaled it the six Masters, it didn't. I didn't feel good about it because my performances wasn't great. But I'm much better at kind of being less harsh on myself and saying, well. At least I won the tournament not feeling good, you know, um, and that's what Steve Peters has helped me do. And uh, I appreciate that victory because it was a win and, mm. um, and I, used to, I had to use a lot of my mental skills to get that victory. I have to look at that as a great leap forward in my career because everyone knows and I know that I've had the ability, but sometimes it's been the application and the mental skill that has let me down. And I'm a much more all-round package now than I was before, so I'm happy for that. You're going to be one of the favourites for the World Championship. Do you mind that, if not the favourite? I don't care, you know, because, you know, um, there's, so, there's so many players out there capable of winning it, and I think everybody within snooker realises that, and anyone that knows snooker as a sport knows that it is on the day. Mm. And um, and as you see from last year, Stuart Bingham um, was probably the least fancied from the semi-final yeah. lineup, and goes on to win it, and um, so it just goes to show that snooker has changed in the last five years since Barry Owens come in. A lot of players that were outside the top 16, top 32, they didn't believe they could win before. Now they, now they believe they belong there because they're playing the top players regular and um, they're hard and match players. So now they go to the Crucible and it's like they're, it's like they're playing down their local snooker club. So, you know, it's, um, there's, there's so much can go on there. But, you know, if I get it right and I play 75, 80% of my game, then I'll be a match for anybody. When I'm talking about you, I can't work out, I can't put my finger on why I think you're getting better with age, you're maturing. Mm which I can't think of any other sportsman where that's happened. Do you think you are getting better? Do you think that you have maybe two or three more World Championship wins in you? I'm, never, I'm not going to say no because um, anything's possible, but the only reason why I think I've matured was because I worked with Steve Peters and I've been able to kind of keep my emotions much more in check. Mm. Whereas if I was working with Steve Peters when I was 20, maybe I'd have had 10 World Titles by now. Um, so I don't think I've become a better player, I've just become the player I was when I was 15, 14, 15, 16, where I was just clear in the mind, I was just fearless. driven. Yeah, kind of fearless in a way, mm. you play with that abandonment in, yeah. in a way, which I feel like you need to in, in, in any era of sport. And uh, I just feel like that that's come back into my game. So my game is where it was when I was 15, 16. Are you looking forward to the World Championships, by the way? I am looking forward Good. to it, yeah. I'm really looking, I'm just happy to be back playing. I'm happy to be back on the circuit. I'm happy doing my stuff with Eurosport. I feel like I've got a great balance in life. And, uh, you know, you just you just want to enjoy it as you get a little bit older. I'm, not, I'm, I'm going to Sheffield just because Sheffield's like a second home for me. I even go there to practice. So I love the place. And uh, the longer I can stay in the tournament, the better. Uh, because I get to see all my friends and that and just have a good time and if you pick a bit of silver at the end, fantastic. If not, I'll be in the studio at Felton doing a bit of punditry work. So I can't lose, really. <laughs> Everyone's a winner. Everyone's a winner. Happy days. <laughs> We're on your start. Top man. Thanks, Cheers, man. Coming up, Andy Goldstein and Ronnie break down one of his wonderful clearances from this year's Masters. And the man himself gets an insight into the world of coaching at Sheffield Snooker Academy. Welcome back to the Ronnie O'Sullivan Show. As we've heard, Ronnie won the Masters earlier this year and his 70-point comeback in the final frame win in the quarters against Mark Selby was a joy to watch. Ronnie takes us through his clearance. 
Now, of course, in the Ronnie O'Sullivan show, quite often you and I have talked through some of your great breaks from years gone by. And this season we've had quite a few to choose from. You knocked in quite a few ton 40s in the Welsh Open. Yeah. Um, but I want to get your view on a, a great frame of snooker from the last day at the Masters. You're 70 points behind. Yeah. And I want to get your view on all the shots in the break, which of course you went on to win the frame, and more importantly, the match. Do you like these frames as a player? Do you like coming to the table thinking, oh, I have nothing to lose here? Because there's no expectation on you at all. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I'm 70 behind, the, red, the Reds are not, not in a favourable position, and I'm playing Mark Selby. The chances of me winning the safety duel with Selby from 70 behind, highly unlikely. So in my mind, I thought, I need to try and win this in one visit if I get the opportunity. But obviously, the balls were not looking favourable, so I had to make it in a way. Mm. Really important for Mark Selby, not just to get a good white, but to get a good safety as well. Yeah, he's played on the... The thin side there, he's obviously not wanting to kiss the black or going off or, or leave me a shot. But now he's kind of left me this long red. It's not one that you really want to go for. If it was okay. like, if it was pretty even, Stevens, you'd probably refuse this. I've hit this sweet. Plum on that red as well. This red here, I played terrible. This was one of the shots where I just wasn't able to feel my shots all through the week. I've made it difficult. Again. Again. That's why it's such a horrible tournament for me. So now. I could have chose to go around the table, get near the red, but I yeah. thought... <sighs> so I just thought, now I'll take this one, just try and get a solid solid strike on this red, yeah. and then um, see if I can leave myself in this area. I only, want, I only want a shot at these colours now. I didn't really fancy this pink, to be honest with you, because it was a delicate touch full shot, and like I said, I didn't feel like my touch was that great. Do you but mind, in, do you mind uh, middle buckets? Do you mind them? No, I think if you strike it well, they usually go in the middle of the hole. But this one here was... Uh, just need to get the black on the spot if I could, because of this red here. So, and I'm thinking black on the spot is easier to get on that red. On so you're, you are thinking there, you're thinking three shots in front. You're yeah. thinking to pop that black yeah. to get on the red, so you can yeah. get on the next black yeah. to pop the last red. So it's yeah. four shots, effectively. Yeah, so it's important for me to try and get the black on the spot in order to get on this last red. Um, would you easily. ever, I was always told, never play um, off a red from a red, so you'd never pop yeah. that and then with the white move this red and flick it out, which I think you'd hold for the black. It, would that ever crush your mind? Well, the only, the like only reason why you wouldn't play it here was because I need the clearance, and if I pop this red, get this red out, my white's near the cushion, then I've got a difficult black so to, get, got on that to get on the red. So okay. the idea is behind it. Okay. So here I've got perfect on the black. And you're never ever thinking about coming round the red at all? Nah, nah, it's too, it's too dangerous. It's too dangerous. But obviously, the fact that you can put the cue in the other hand now. Yeah, well, I did, yeah, I mean, I could have done, but I mean, don't want to be playing this with your other hand because this is not an easy shot. But, you know, it's one of them that I had to go for and I had to kind of commit to it um, because this is virtually frame and match ball, really. Yeah. Right. I didn't actually feel that much pressure here because I thought that I wasn't expected to clear up. I wasn't playing great. I didn't expect to win the tournament the way I was playing. So I kind of just going through the motions, really. I was just trying to take one ball at a time. Um, I want to ask you about this black because um, it's a fantastic shot to get on that yellow. Yeah. Uh, you have to force it in. There's mm. no way you can play it smoother with running top right. Top. I just want to hit it strong, positive, hear the black hit the back of the pocket, get the white into the middle of the table, and the best way to do that is to really be firm and get a good contact on the white. And if you see the white here, you see it bounces, mm. but you kind of got to kill the white, so you kind of... It's a great shot. It's such a yeah. difficult shot to play as well. Sometimes the firmer and stronger you hit the ball, the more control you have over the white ball, you know? So it's, it's about hitting the ball with a bit of authority sometimes, especially under pressure, Four because days. under pressure you can get a bit twitchy. I think at this point now, if I don't clear up, I'll be really disappointed. So I think this is why I played the wrong shot on the green one. Really, yeah. I played the, the chicken shot, where the bottle shot really which is just to screw it over here. If I hit it really good, then I'll be on the brown. But I just didn't quite hit it great, so I've then left myself a difficult but, brown. But this is that's what it, happens. It was an awful shot. Yeah, it was a was a very bad shot. <laughs> but I, res I rescued it pretty well. But it's loose, isn't it? That's what it is. You've lost control of it. Yeah, it's loose. You know, instead of being here, I'm, I'm here. So now I have to go all around the table, and I'm not thinking about getting on the blue. I'm just thinking get close to the blue. I don't care what. I don't care where I land on the table as long as I'm okay. within that far so, of the blue. So that's what you're playing. So if I'm near the blue, 
I can manipulate See, the white a lot okay. easier. So you're thinking about not necessarily an easier shot on the blue next, you're thinking about an easy way to get on the pink from the blue. Yeah, well, I'm I just want to make the game, if, if, if I could pop like Neil Robertson and Judd Trump, then I'd probably leave my white here and have no problem with it. I'm using my advantage, which is my knowledge of the table and the angles, and I go, that's a billiard shot to me, that's just like a pop in there, yeah. cannon, that, cannon that there, cannon that there, and that takes me towards the pink. So, Something uh, like Selby would have probably played this shot, Steve Davis would have probably played this shot. Okay. Someone like Hendry would probably put it in the corner. Okay. And this shot here, I mean, it's got so many elements can go wrong. Yeah, this is probably the best shot I hit all match. Uh, I kind of, as soon as I hit it, I was like, oh, that felt good. And it went right into the wide part of the pocket. Look, bang, right it's in the middle. Ah, oh, just something like straight on the black. And uh, I thought, I can't miss this black now. I mean... Here it goes. Yeah. Nice, nice feeling. feeling yeah. yeah, great feeling, yeah. 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 You always like beat Mark Selby, don't you? Listen, um, he's, he's world number one, he's, he's a tough competitor, and, and any victory against Mark Selby, you know you've earned it. Coaching is something you don't hear much about in the game, but today I've come down to Sheffield Snooker Academy to find out what goes on behind the scenes, and our coaches develop the young talent into the future of our game, and see if I can get a few tips myself. Hi Barry, thanks Hi. for joining us here on Eurosport. We've come along to Sheffield Academy today to try and find out what makes a coach and a good coach. So when it comes to spotting a player, um, and I'm going to take you back to when you probably first see Kyron Wilson playing, what was it in Kyron that made you think, yeah, this guy's got it? Well, you, you can spot natural ability right from the word go. You know, is he comfortable on the shot? Has he got the, this desire? You can see that. And with Kyron particularly, he worked harder than anybody else. Mm. I first met him at one of the summer schools I was conducting, and straight away he was the one that wanted to be on the table all the time. Barry, am I doing this right? Am I doing that? Why did I miss that shot? He asked more questions. He worked harder. Mm. That's what I liked. Uh, yeah. And th the one element with Kyron also is he enjoyed what he was doing. Mm. And he asked so many questions. <laughs> it was the bane of my life at that time. But I enjoyed passing the knowledge on, and he's now reaping the reward. So how much would you say, from a, from a coaching side, uh, is it a mixture of uh, ability and hard work? I think it goes without saying, Ronnie, you've got to have the ability. Mm. You know, that's point one. But then, even with the ability yourself included, mm. I mean, there's nobody got more natural ability than you, but you still have to work hard. Mm. Otherwise, you're going to get nowhere in this game. I mean, that fellow that you are playing against, even if he's your best friend, mm. he's trying to take the bread and butter out of your mouth mm. yeah. and you can't let him. Mm. So you've got to work harder than he is. Yeah. Is that yeah. something you work with as well with Kyron, is the mental side of the game oh, as well yeah. as the physical aspect? Yes, yes, yeah, very much so. I mean, this is why we go away together a lot. We share a room together and I look after him, we go swimming, uh, I make sure his physical side is OK, he's healthy, he still plays football, still yeah. enjoys it. Yeah. I believe that you are a better player because of your physical fitness mm. than you were, say, some, some time ago when you was, when you were a little bit chubby at one time. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for that. Just getting back to quote with Kyron, how would that kind of be then, just say you're in a match and it's probably not going so great for him, you know he can play better, he's maybe 3-1 down. Now, what would you say to him at that time? Right, well, what we've worked on is a pre-shot routine. Mm. I mean, I've learnt a lot from other sports. I mean, Jack Nicholas, uh, the great golfer, always said he would never play a shot without going through his pre-shot routine, mm. whether that was in practice or in a match. I'm the same with Kyron. We concentrate on that. Mm. And, uh, and looking after the mental side, you know, if you, in practice, point that cue, do what you always do, mm. and invariably the ball goes in, mm. Why shouldn't you be mentally strong? Mm, that's true. <laughs> you know, so yeah. that, that's where we work. So you time. believe the two work together. You build oh. the confidence, you build the game, the mental side then falls into it as well. It's kind of like, it's like Ron, a catch-22 situation. Ronnie, isn't it? you've hit the nail on the head. That's yeah. exactly what I mean. And how much pleasure do you get from seeing a player come through, making them little improvements? And Ronnie, I love it, mm. honestly. Um, I've been working with Karen since he was about 13, maybe 14. I have had the privilege of watching the progression from each mm. step up the ladder mm. and I thoroughly, and I mean thoroughly, enjoy it. Do you think coaching has changed 
as well as the, the game? Certainly, um, in the old days with the heavy ball and the heavy, heavy cloth, you had to thump the ball a little bit. Now mm. it's more about stroking the ball. Mm. If I hear a beginner mm. I, and those two balls collide, I hear a clunk, yeah. you know? If I hear a good player, I don't hear a, a clunk, I hear a click. And then when you're playing particularly, I don't know when it's these things, Ronnie, or what, my mm. hearing aids, but I don't hear even hear a click, I hear click and I go, Ronnie's in here somewhere. <laughs> That's what I'm trying to find with mm. with uh, Kyron, mm. that sweetness of contact. And I think that's where the where the game has changed quite significantly, mm. yeah. Have you got any tips for me, Pat? Um, I will say one thing, yeah? Yeah. Keep the fitness up. Keep the fitness up, OK. That's, that's a good tip. I like that. <laughs> You're a PE teacher, so I wouldn't have yeah, expected yeah, anything yeah. less. Barry, it's been great to talk to you today. I want to wish you the best of luck with Kyron and his career. We'll see you around, yeah? Lovely. Take Thanks, it Ronnie. Cheers, Lovely. Mate. Thank you. Thanks for joining us here at Eurosport. We've come down to your academy here in Sheffield, a place I regularly visit. Yes. Got a lot of top players here. I know you've got a few youngsters coming through, um, very, very young, 9, 10, 11, 12 years of age. Can you talk me through the, the, the three or four good ones that you've got? Yeah, we've got some good youngsters at the minute. The youngest one's Brandon. He's nine years old. Um, good technique, you know. They all have to be fair. Hopefully that's down at me. But mm. for nine years old, he's got the hunger for the game, yeah. which is what you're looking for. Yeah. Enthusiasm in the game. Technique we can we can keep building on. You know, when you when you try to get through to youngsters and they feel they're not getting it, he gets it and they come back with a bit more to you. Mm. And you, you feed off them as much as them feeding off yeah. you. Yeah. So I think that's what you're looking for from for real youngsters. And then you just put them on the right path and hope that they keep developing. But to see smiles on their faces yeah. when they get what you're trying to put through to mm. them. Um, and a disappointment to a certain extent when they don't do it, mm. but come back again stronger. If there's a player out there and your coach is a player, what player would you say to him, go and watch? Who would you say is the most perfect, complete snooker player that kind of ticks probably all boxes? It pains me to say it, but probably Robertson. Neil Robertson, OK. People would want me to say Ding. Mm. And you know, technically great thing, knowledge. But I think Robertson's got that as well. You know, you'd want a bit of you, you'd want a bit of Ding. Yeah. You'd want Selby. Yeah. You know, yeah. grafting and all that. Mm. But Robertson, I don't know. He just seems to have the aggression. He has the mm. long ball, long game. He has mm. break building. He just yeah, mm. and, yeah. I admire him. He's, he's and he's overseas, which again impressive. Come. Impressive yeah. what yeah. is the story, wasn't it? Uh, yeah. You know, coming through. Gal's been great. Good. Having us down here. Thank you, mate. Thanks for sharing no your problem. knowledge with us and good luck with all the up and coming stars. Yeah. Don't coach them too well, mate, because uh, <laughs> make my life a bit more difficult. A little nine year old coming up and look at him. He's fine. I'll be dead and gone by then. <laughs> <laughs> all right, girl, thanks for that. Enough. Cheers, mate. That's it for now. Stick with us for all your snooker coverage live here on Eurosport.